Uh, Nicole Morris is the director of the Human First Laboratory uh, here in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, she is also an assistant adjunct professor in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering. Her research focuses on human-computer interactions with technology related to transportation. And her research interests include multisensory perception, aging, judgment and decision making, usability, and human factors. She received her PhD in human factor psychology at Wichita State University in 2011 and joined us shortly thereafter. Uh, her previous uh, work on computer aid crash reports, usability, and design. Uh, was recognized uh, with the Best Practice Award by the Association of Transportation Safety Information Professionals. Uh, and in fact, the former NHTSA, that's the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the administrator, uh, Mark, uh, let me remember his name, Mark Rosekind, actually came to the university to meet uh, uh, with Dr. Morris. Uh, they were so impressed. I should point out that every crash in the state of Minnesota uh, is documented in the crash report database that was designed uh, by Dr. Morris and her team, and that's since January of 2016, am I right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, she was also interviewed by Bruce Feiler for the New York Times. Uh, that article, Teenage Drivers Be Very Afraid, appeared in the issue of the March 19, 2016. I don't know if you know who Bruce Feiler is, but he is an internationally known writer for the New York Times and published many books on very, uh, various topics. Anyway, I don't want to hold her up. Her research project that she's presenting today is designing in-vehicle systems for high-risk drivers, bridging the gap between teens and older drivers. Without further ado. Thanks, Max. Okay, so um, we're going to sort of go across the spectrum of, of ages and talking about risks and, and why certain drivers are at risk. Um, one of the things that really sort of caught fire in that New York Times interview that I did uh, back when was I, I told Bruce, I said, um, if you're going to have an early and untimely death, the most likely time that that's going to happen is between the ages of 16 and 17, and the reason for it is driving. And that seemed really scary to people. A lot of people don't know that that is true. Um, this data is a little hard to compile, so it's, um, it's from 2001 to 2010, and we don't have a more a recent updated one for the, the more recent traffic crashes. But looking at just Minnesota, 15 to 17-year-olds between 2001 and 2010, um, the, the traffic crashes really um, make every other cause of death for teens really pale in comparison. Um, it's, a, it's a huge problem, and, and so that's really where these statistics come from, that if you're going to have an early and untimely death, the most likely time are between these ages, and the reason is driving. Um, driving is extremely dangerous for, for teens. Um, it's extremely dangerous for all of us. So when we think about 2016, so this is the most recently available national traffic data, we see that... Um, 37,000 plus people were killed on our road. So imagine filling Target Stadium, imagine that whole stadium, pretty much packed to the gills, all those people dead in a single year. That's how many people die on our roadways every year, um, about that same amount that can fill Target Stadium. So this is huge. Um, and if you walk down the street and you ask someone, What's the most likely reason somebody dies in a traffic crash? What's the number one killer on our roads today? What are they going to say? Distracted, Distracted driving. More specifically, they're going to say what? Texting, Texting right? Texting. So when we think about um, you know, our, our cause of death, when we look at fatal crashes, uh, and this is, let's preface it to say, difficult because the police are, are gathering information after the fact. Um, when we look at the information they are able to gather, in 2016, we had 3,450 um, fatalities that are dis distracted driving involved in some way. Not cell phones, just any type of distraction. So then that's only 9.2 of all of our fatal crashes in 2016 were distraction related. And then you say, well, that's all drivers. That's surely not teen drivers. Right? It's got to be number one for teens. 
So we don't have this more specific information yet for 2016, so I'm leaning on 2015, but in 2015, we had around 3,100 teens um, involved in fatal crashes. How many of those were distracted? 290. Most people think that's drastically underreported, but that's the, that's the crashes, that's the, that's the reports, right? We, we can debate this in, in a bit. Um, people don't believe me when I say that this is true. I've had DO, state DOT people say, this can't be true. I say, well, it's your data. I don't know what to tell you. I'm just running the numbers. I'm just crunching, um, crunching them down. And then we say, okay, of those that were distracted, the 290, how many of those were involved in a cell phone? And I'm not talking texting. This could be dialing, reaching, talking, texting, any, any shape. Um, that the police thought they were interacting with their cell phones in 2015, only 64 of them died. All right, so let's break that down into percentages. 9% of all fatal teen crashes were distraction involved at some point. Um, and then of all fatal teen driver crashes, 2% were cell phone texting or some other sort of cell phone involved, right? This is not what you hear on the news. Go to sleep or tiredness, I guess. What's that? You go to sleep or tiredness, falling asleep behind the wheel. Oh, right. It could be sleep. I mean, there's lots of other things, right? And this is very difficult to know what happened. Um, without cameras being in the car, we don't know totally what happened. So these numbers could be small and, and, and underreported. Um, they also could be overreported. So distracted driving is serious. Anytime I have this discussion with someone, I never want them to walk away and think that Dr. Morris at the University of Minnesota said texting doesn't kill people or distracted driving doesn't kill people. It kills thousands of people, no doubt, every year. Um, but it's only one of many risk factors for teens. Teens have been killing themselves on the road for decades, long before cell phones. And if we took away all cell phones tomorrow, uh, we're not going to save all of these teens' lives. So what's happening? What other things are going on? So of the, the fatal teen crashes, we have 56% of them um, were unbuckled, right? This is huge. And this doesn't get to crash causality, of course, but this has to do with your ability to survive a crash, right? So if you're in a rollover crash, which seems really severe, if you're buckled, you're going to walk away from that crash very easily. If you're not buckled, you're not likely to walk away from that crash. So if we could just get 100% um, you know, seatbelt use, we would shrink this number by over half likely. Um, then thinking about alcohol, um, so even though it's illegal for teens, they're still drinking and driving. And so we have about 31% of our fatal injuries um, involve BAC, uh, greater than 0.08. And then these things are sort of additive with one another. So if you're um, alcohol involved, you're also more likely to not be buckled. Right? You're already making a bad decision, which is underage drinking and drinking and driving, and likely then you're going to make one more bad decision, which is to not buckle. Speeding is a, is a, a big one that's underreported um, within our kind of public discourse, but within the crash reporting data, we see this huge. And this is true for teens, and it's true for all drivers that we have around a third of all fatal crashes are speeding involved. Okay. <laughs> And this is a big one, and this was something that, again, was um, I talked about in the New York Times um, that I think is people are just not aware of this in, in a, the same scale that they should be, which is that passengers for teens is really dangerous. And so if you have one passenger, the risk of a fatal crash goes up, two passengers goes up, and it's, this is really an exponential pattern of how many passengers you have in the car. And this is especially bad for male teens and male passengers. So if you have a male driver and a car full of male teens, um, then the, the risk of fatal crashes is, is very high. It's actually, as you might guess, a little bit lower if it's a male driver and female passengers. It'd be on better behavior a little bit, but do we, we do see some protective nature um, of females being the, the passenger of male drivers. Um, and then we also see these things again sort of um, falling on each other. So if you have peers in the car, you're also more likely to not buckle. Um, so, so another sort of risk in, in terms of your ability to survive a crash when you have teens in the car less likely to buckle. And then we also see this thing with speeding. 
So if you're a male teen driver and you have male teen passengers, um, that doubled the likelihood that you were speeding. And this was really kind of a clever little study that they did outside of a high school on the East Coast. They're sort of spotting and then tracking the speeds as they were going away from high schools and looking to see are they male and, and what's the passenger number and, and gender of drivers and, and um, passengers. And they found this really interesting thing here. So this is really complicated. And it really shows that there's no one silver bullet that we could take to save all these teens' lives. Um, and automated vehicles are not going to save us tomorrow, so let's just put that aside. So what can we do to sort of have this um, really holistic approach to all of these various behaviors? Distraction is a problem. Speeding is a problem. Passengers are a problem. Not buckling your seatbelt is a problem. So that's really what we, we um, tried to take on and tackle with this very large study that we did a number of years ago um, where we were really capitalizing on the smartphone, and, and this was really um, big credit to Max Donath of really seeing the future of what was going to be happening with smartphones before anybody could really predict um, just how pervasive these essentially mini computers were going to be um, for, for drivers. And so we can capitalize on all of those sensors, so our ability to, to get speed and position um, of the roadway, and then incorporate those with sensors of seatbelt and floorboards to know are they buckled and who's in the car and that kind of thing. And then we can be giving teens real-time feedback because we know that if, if parents are really involved, have parents in the car that's sort of coaching the teens, slow down, put on your seatbelt, that kind of thing, then they're more likely to behave a little bit better, right? But a parent can't always do that. You think you get your teen trained up and, and you assume they're a good kid because they get good grades? Spoiler alert, good grades don't have anything to do with safe driving, um, but insurance companies will give you a good discount anyway, even though they know that's not true. Um, so how can we kind of provide an electronic surrogate for parents um, so that it's like they're there coaching the teen, telling them to slow down, telling them to do this thing with their smartphone, um, and then also restrict their ability to use that phone while they're driving. So we can try to tackle all of these things at once, um, save alcohol use. That's maybe futuristic for us. Um, so these are the things we really, really wanted to look at. Um, Seatbelt speeding, stop sign violations if we know where they are, if they're in the metro, and then even curfew violations because um, teen drivers under graduated dri dri driver's licensing laws have restrictions on how late they can be out. And so if we detect the phone out driving at midnight, we know that they're breaking curfew. Um, we can also use the accelerometer of the phone to see did they do a hard braking, hard turning, hard accelerator, um, and then also give them a little bit extra information. You know, they're, they're novice drivers, they're not as aware of their road conditions, they're not familiar with the roads that they're on, so they may not know what the speed limit is or that, that there's a curve up ahead in the roadway. So we can prep them with this information um, as they're driving. And a big goal is to keep parents in the loop. So this is really kind of how the system worked where if you're a teen driving down the roadway, it's 55 miles an hour, you're going to see that white speed limit sign. And that's really all you're going to see. That's the majority of what you're going to see if you're driving safely, following the, the rules of the roadway, is you're going to see a white speed limit sign. And we use your GPS location and compare that to a database of what's the speed limit of that roadway. If you go about three to four miles an hour over the speed limit, then you're going to get that yellow um, indicator to say, hey, you're speeding a little bit. Um, probably need to slow down, but they're not going to hear anything at that point. So they're kind of in that yellow zone. Um, and then if they hit about seven miles an hour over the speed limit or, or up, it turns red, and at that point the phone is going to say, exceeding speed limit, reduce speed now. Or as the teens would say, it screams at them, exceeding speed limit, reduce speed now. <laughs> Even though it's the Google voice, and I've never experienced her screaming at me. Um, she's always a robot. So. Anyway, it does that, and then once it says exceeding speed limit, reduce speed now, we give the teen an opportunity to, to fix their behavior. This is just good human factors, where you detect an error and you give somebody the opportunity to undo that error, right? And then they're also just teens, and they, they want to do something sort of fun, but they, they need somebody to sort of bring them back down to earth. So we'll give them one more warning, a second warning. They don't slow down. Then they're going to get a third warning. At that point, it's going to say exceeding speed, or excuse me, it'll say reduce speed now or parents will be notified. And then they have in between zero and five seconds at random to get back under that threshold. Um, and if they don't, then the phone automatically texts their parents 
and their parents receive a text message something like this that says speed violation 39 in a 30 miles an hour on Stinson Road near 35th Avenue Northeast, date and time stamp. Right? So the parents know in real time, and then you know it says text message sent, and the parents know, and the teens know, everybody knows that the teens sort of turkey is cooked. Right? So when they get home at night, the idea is that um, there's a very detailed conversation about what happened today um, when they were out on Stinson Road. Right? Um, other things that it does, um, in this study it had a sensor on the seatbelt, and so if you weren't buckled, it would give you warnings. If you didn't heed the warnings, text message got sent. Um, if you had a hard braking, hard turning, or hard um, acceleration maneuver, then you got a warning text message sent. Um, and if you ran a stop sign, text message sent. And it actually gave detailed information to say they went through the stop sign at, say, 45 miles an hour versus 7 miles an hour. Yes? Well, how does it differentiate if you're avoiding, say, somebody? It doesn't. Right. It doesn't. So that's a limitation of this, right? You could have cameras in the car that are looking forward and looking in cab, but then that's, you know, very expensive and, and it requires a whole team of people to go through and review those videos and, and determine was that appropriate or not. And surely there are times when you heartbreak and that's exactly what you should have done. Um, but if you're getting into lots of heartbreaking maneuvers every single day of the week, then we've got a problem, right? Um, and so no doubt teens played that card and they probably played it well for a short amount of time. Um, but if parents were savvy, they would know that the teen can't play that card every day, right? Okay, so we did this in a field operational test. Um, 30 newly licensed teen drivers in Minnesota. So we were finding them when they were 15, about ready to turn 16. Got them excited about joining the study. They got a smartphone, and they were going to get the smartphone, all data and, and everything. Um, it was going to be the Samsung Galaxy S. Three, I want to say, it was like the new hottest phone, um, save iPhone. Um, and they were going to be with us for, for four weeks, or excuse me, 12 months, and we wanted to get them all installed within four weeks of passing their driver's license. So as quickly as we could, some teens the very same day, they passed their test, they went to the dealership and got installed and ready to go. And we started collecting data immediately on them. Um, and then we divided them up into three groups. So we had um, 100 teens, it ended up being 92 that completed the study, were in the baseline group. So they didn't get any coaching. Parents were totally in the dark, never found out anything. Um, as far as they were concerned, this was just a naturalistic driving study. How do teens naturally drive? Then we had a TDSS coach group is what I call it. And this group only had in vehicle coaching only. So there was no what you would call tattletale function for this group. So we just want to know how, how effective are the warnings in and of themselves. Um, and then there was the TDSS parent group, and that had the full um, kit and caboodle where teens were warned and parents were notified. And we did this in 18 communities. We really tried to balance them in these um, six types of communities. Um, so we were trying to control as much as we could socioeconomic status, um, commuting rates high, low, so how much did a community work and live in their community versus being more of a bedroom community where nobody works but everybody lives and they drive out to another place to live, right? Um, so we see this more in like suburban areas versus more isolated small towns where everybody lives and works. So trying to identify some different types of travel behaviors. Um, we looked at rural, uh, rural and suburban. We didn't look at right in the Twin Cities metro like center because a lot of those teens just don't drive. Right? They just re re rely on public um, transit until they're say 18, 19. Um, and then we were also looking by county fatal crash rates to make sure we didn't see anything um, unusual. right? So how did we do? So in terms of speeding, we saw very um, little difference, interestingly, between the TDSS coach and the TDSS parent group. So we were able to drastically reduce um, the percentage of miles traveled over seven plus miles an hour um, through the year. And it really didn't matter. It wasn't statistically different whether or not parents were involved and those types of warnings, which is really good for the warnings. It sort of means they were sufficiently annoying in and of themselves, and maybe you could say that would be um, a more palatable system to, to send out to teens, that we're going to help you be safe, but we're not going to get you in trouble in the meantime um, of it, right? So our excessive braking was a little messier, um, but what's interesting about this is um, some of this idea was that teens in their very first days of driving haven't quite learned the mechanics of driving. So they don't 
quite have the right control and they have a hard time braking smoothly. Um, and so this is looking at those excessive maneuvers, but you can see the bottom group, which is the TDSS parent group, they're pretty flat along the way, which means they had the skills from day one. The rest of the teams just didn't have the motivation to implement their skills. So we saw they were higher and there was not a huge difference between the coaching group and the parent group. Um, and I say this is partially because those warnings were sort of one and done. Like you had the hard break maneuver, you got a single warning about it, but it wasn't going to keep going on and you weren't going to hear about it when you got home. Um, and so that seems to be why um, those things didn't really matter. So this was really a successful um, study and we're really proud of, of what we found with this. But so moving on, what's next? Teens are only on the road for a short duration, right? It's a dangerous duration. And you know it, it has a lot of casualties during those couple of years, but then they become adults, and then then they're a problem for a really long time. Um, and adults still get in fatal crashes, right? Not at the same quite rate, um, but for decades they are on the roadway. And so, um, you know, we we're trying to think how can we capitalize on all drivers because this is a great system for teens. I tested a lot. I really liked driving with it. Um, and then we started to think, well, who are other high-risk road groups that um, could, could use this? And older drivers was really the natural next fit. Um, with the exception that there's some skepticism of how much are older drivers going to want to use a smartphone in an app while they drive, right? Um, but older drivers are a lot more tech savvy, I think, than we give them credit for. So we have a lot of older drivers on the roadway, and that's just ex um, expected to continue to, to boom as we go forward, right? So our boomers are getting older, and so um, we have this 13.5% um, of the population on the road, and that's going to increase to 20%. And, and then they're in that age group, that 65 plus, for, for a really long time, many, many years. And they're the second highest injury and fatality group next to teens per licensed drivers. And then when we look at just how much they drive, crashes by vehicle miles traveled, they're number one, right? So they don't drive as much as teens, but when they do, they're more likely to get in a crash per mile. Um, so we see that they are kind of relatively low in, in some of their representation of all crashes, but when they do get in crashes, they're more likely to die. And, and this is a sad reality of just the fragility of older people, that a 19-year-old body can sustain quite a bit of trauma, but a 70-year-old body cannot. So when I look at this trend, um, it's really interesting to see this, this crash involvement, fatal crash involvement, um, by these bend years. So we start 16 to 19. It's pretty high in comparison to that middle group. But once we start sitting, hitting 65, it really goes up. And so we have our old, and then we have our oldest old, and, and those groups um, are, are really drastically um, disproportionately involved in, in crashes. So like I said, we have some, some things just related to pure fragility. But then there's other things like um, failure to yield, lower seatbelt rate, poor visual search, and, and just general um, declines in information processing as you age, just normal aging cognitive declines. So our purpose of, of these next sort of series of studies that we did was to see how can we adapt the TDSS system, this really successful system designed specifically for teens, how can we design that for older drivers? Um, carefully looking at what are their needs, what are their limitations, and how can we rebuild the system to account for those things? And, and it seemed like a system like this is really well positioned to provide that tailored support for this very unique population. Um, and then how we would do this is through what we call iterative design. So working with a user population, providing them the product, testing, making changes, give it back, make testing, and it just goes back and forth until you, you have done sufficient testing and iterative design that you have designed something that really feels like it's designed by the user um, and it's certainly for the user. So one of the very first things we did was we um, did some focus groups. And so we did this right here, mechanical engineering sitting around that very table. And originally we were just recruiting tech savvy drivers because we didn't, 
We didn't think it made a whole lot of sense to talk to older drivers that don't have smartphones, don't use tablets, don't use navigation. What's the likelihood that they would be open to this or want to talk about a system if they're so kind of um, separated from use of this type of technology? So we got a group of, of these tech-savvy users, and um, right away they weren't a fan of what we were doing. So I'm like, I want to design this older driver system to you. How do you think that that sounds? And they're like, nope, try again. So um, they really didn't like that, that we were trying to do something catered to their age group. The question was sort of like, why us? There's nothing wrong with us. Um, we're not at risk. And I'm kind of going like, well, you kind of are, but I don't know how to handle this. And, and so we had a lot of this kind of back and forth discussion. Um, and they really resisted the need, the idea that they would need the system. And then we said, well, what about in 10 years? Nope, I won't need the system in 10 years. Right, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. We had, I had all these really creative names, like senior, or season, or aging, or you know, whatever. Anything that sounded like that, they were like, no. Um, they want this to be for all drivers. They'd use it possibly, if it's for all drivers and we're not really signaling or singling them out. So we got a lot of good feedback, and, and I was sort of feeling uh, silly for some of my ideas that I brought to them, and they're like, I need a, you think I need an advanced sundown notification? Like, you think I don't know when the sun is going down? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I thought it was a good idea. They were like, it wasn't. <laughs> so then somewhere along the line in that recruitment, we had gotten um, interest from people that weren't tech savvy, but they kind of heard about the study and they wanted to participate. So at some point we had enough of them. We're like, well, let's do another focus group of these non-tech savvy people. See what they have to say. I mean, it was really interesting because they were far more accepting of the system, which um, was strange because they don't even want to use a smartphone. But yet, the idea of something like this they thought was a really good idea. Um, I have a couple theories about this. One is that possibly they're not using smartphones because they are kind of having some cognitive declines. This is just a theory. Um, and because of that, they are starting to see the limit of their independence. Right? The very tech-savvy drivers, the ones that have smartphones and have tablets and do all this stuff, um, they don't see an, an insight for their clear cognition, and so they don't see a need for this. But potentially the tech-savvy people can already see a potential loss of independence. And so any opportunity to help them hold on to that and, and hold on to their ability to drive independently was really important. Um, at one point, I we were closing down one of these focus groups, and... I said, okay, as we, as we finish up here, just what would you like me to leave with? You know, what's a final message? For me as this young researcher, what do you want me to know about you? And this woman looked at me and looked at me right in the eye, and she said, just don't let us lose our independence. And I'm like, okay, I won't. I won't. Um, but it was very emotional. And, and you can see that this is very important. It's very tied to mental health. Um, it actually becomes a cyclical issue for older drivers where um, depression leads to declines in cognitive impairment, then cognitive impairment leads to more loss of independence, and then it sort of is a feedback cycle. Um, so it's really critical to do what we can to help older people retain their independence, to help them retain good cognition, mental health, because all those things feed each other and make for a healthy population. Um, and, and these things are, are much uh, less expensive than some of the alternatives. So um, beyond that, we started speaking in depth with older drivers. So after the focus group, we wanted to do some really in-depth interviews um, to, to dig into some of these things in, in a non-group setting. And then we were also talking to experts, so experts in gerontology and occupational therapy. And we heard some really interesting things, certainly from these experts who were saying um, we really need to provide more contextual information, more information than the, the TDSS app was already providing, which we were kind of going from a human factor standpoint, that doesn't seem right. We would want to simplify it rather than make it more complicated. Um, and they were saying, no, 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 they need all this contextual information to be able to drive safely. And so we're like, okay, well, we'll test it. So we started building in these things. Um, one thing is, you know, the, in the TDSS study, the sensors on the seatbelts, 
they were a little wonky and, and the magnets were always falling off and it just didn't seem like something that would be viable going forward. And um, so in lieu of those sensors and something more integrated into the car's um, sort of automatic warning system, we talked about we could do seatbelt reminders and check mirror reminders at the beginning of a drive. Um, and they were th saying things like, you can't just say the speed limit is changing to 60. You need to say this is the current speed and this is the upcoming speed. So we sort of started to design some of that. And then we heard a lot about under-speeding for older drivers. This idea that they're, they're always going to be at risk, not because they're speeding, but because they're going under the speed limit. So that's really tricky because um, yellow and red is obvious. Right? That's a pretty universal traffic um, color coding scheme for you're going too fast. But what's the co color code for going too slow? And we went. <laughs> that, that's yeah, right, yeah, right, right. Getting left scary. in the dust. Scary. I'm sure it is. It, it, you, if you read the article in the Emmy magazine this fall about the, the guy that races his motorcycles at Bonneville, mm -hmm. okay, he's my partner. I'm the guy mentioned in the article with him. Okay. He's 74 years old, and we have been passed about a dozen times on the berm because he drives way too slow uh, when he's driving on the highway. And this is a guy that's licensed to go 200 miles an hour now. Right. And yet, he is absolutely a roadblock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it creates a dangerous speed differential, going far below the speed limit, or sometimes, truthfully, and this is a sad reality, if the speed limit is 65 and everybody's going 75 and you go 65, you're actually potentially creating a speed differential that's risky. It's I would prefer everybody to just go 65. I don't know the great solution. Um, yeah? I was asked a question. You said that you said that those are the speeds that are being paid. I grew up in Sweden in Australia, okay, in both countries. Uh, GPs are cheaper than the government's It's done here. It's not done as often as it should. So there's um, a lot of police officers that will tell you uh, on the side that they, are, they feel really bad to do it. And so they will sometimes do it. But if, if it's very clear that an older driver, I mean, I, you know. Okay. But now it's just voluntary. Huh. And I think only California and Pennsylvania have, well, I'm thinking from the perspective of dementia. Okay. Like, right, yeah. And, and there's even, it varies by state whether or not you can anonymous, anonymously report a family member. Um, some states don't allow you to do that, and some do, and, and so, yeah, it's tricky. It's really tricky. Um, so underspeeding is a risk. Um, I think it's, it's hard to say how much that actually contributes to some of these crashes. <laughs> is it warmer there? Is it warm there right now? Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah. So after we kind of gathered a lot of this information, um, it, it was clear we really needed to, to test this interface, get the, get the user's feedback outside of a driving, actual driving situation. Um, but when we're kind of sitting around that focus group, we're sitting around the table, and the way we're explaining the system to them, the older drivers are like, that just sounds like it's going to be going off all the time, and I'm going to be overwhelmed, and I'm going to be inundated with messages. And so it was really hard to convince them what it was actually going to be like outside of actually seeing it for themselves. So we came up with this really innovative approach, which um, I'm going to call an immersive usability test. So um, this is a picture of my driving simulator upstairs, or I should say my old driving simulator upstairs. I have a brand new one. Um, but it was a uh, Saturn cab. Uh, full chassis, and we have these kind of screens that, that wrap around the car, and we had this rural driving route, and so you can kind of see this is a real Minnesota route. Um, I think it's something like 21 miles of, of roadway, and so what we did was we programmed the simulation to drive as an automated vehicle would. So you're sitting in the driver's seat, and the car's going to drive itself, 
Um, but it's going to drive itself in sort of a naughty way. So it's not going to follow the rules of the roadway. There are going to be times when it's going to go under the speed limit, over the speed limit, uh, brake too hard, run the stop sign, sort of do the, the types of behaviors that this system would be designed to give you feedback about. And so we had the older driver sit in the driver's seat and pretend like they're driving, but they're not actually in control in the vehicle. And the reason we did this is because if we actually had them do a driving simulation, it would be very difficult to control and make sure every driver saw the same messages. Right, because they only get triggered when you speed, and they only get triggered if you run the stop sign. And if they never do that, then we don't have ability to get their feedback on what that warning was like and how much did they like it. Um, the other thing we wanted to test was, you know, what would it look like if you were using it, say, in conjunction with navigation? So we thought some of our older drivers would maybe want to be using something like maybe Google Maps simultaneously with this system, and and so how could we make those go together? And so what we learned was um, that. They reported it was lower than expected mental workload and distraction for the system. So they were really pleasantly surprised when they sat down and experienced the system, that it, it wasn't pestering them, it wasn't going off all the time, it rarely did hardly anything um, except these few times when they would have um, something. But then some of the things that we heard from these gerontologists, like provide all this contextual information of what's the current speed limit, what's the next speed limit, these older drivers were going like, no, I don't need that. That's too much information. That's overkill. I don't really care that it's 50 changing to 45. Just tell me it's changing to 45. And I can hardly see it anyway. Um, so the other thing was this underspeeding thing, which I think, let me go back really quickly. Um, I think that I didn't mention it, but one of the things we came up with was a turtle. This was the closest thing of like a universal symbol or design of what's slow, a turtle slow. So we had it so it would sort of turn gray and put a little turtle up at the top. And it was almost sort of started as a joke, but people really liked the idea. Um, but in practice, when we did it in this simulation, they almost never noticed it. It was too small. Um, and, and so it didn't seem like it was going to be a very good option. I'm not saying you can't come up with some um, feedback for that type of behavior, but we didn't come up with anything. Um, so at the end of the day, all of the potential changes that we thought we were going to make through these early processes of kind of hearing things, when the older drivers actually sat down and experienced the system as the teen would have, um, we found that there was very little to no things that needed to be changed outside of taking away some of the language of parents and teens. But the basic way that it notified you about speeding and excessive maneuvers, all of that was good as is. And, and so really this gets to... Um, this idea that the older drivers can be best supported with a universally designed system. So that means that it's something that's created to address the needs and risks of all drivers, not specifically targeted for, all, for older drivers. Um, and this is really key. It's sort of like it, it took me a little bit to go full circle from the very, very first thing I heard in those focus groups, which is don't give us something that's specifically designed for us. Give us something that's designed for all drivers, and we'll use it. Um, and this is true with a lot of other traffic, transportation safety types of things, where you have um, you know, easy access ramps up curbs. right? So obviously, those are, are really beneficial to people in wheelchairs. right? But they're also really beneficial to moms with baby strollers and, you know, just when you're running and don't want to catch your toe. I mean, it, it's great for this very specific population, but it actually makes it easier for us to use that part of the sidewalk, um, everyone. And so if you think about things in that way, um, one, it makes it easier and cheaper to try to market something. Because you're not trying to go over um, after an audience that's not very sexy, right? No marketing firm is really excited about marketing something to older drivers, which is sort of sad and foolish because it's a huge buying population, right? Those are the populations that have a lot of money to buy really nice cars, but nobody wants to market to them. Um, so if you can design something that can be marketable and good for all populations, then it's a lot easier to get that through the door. And so, um, you know, just to think about this a little bit further. So the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation and specialized design. So this is what I really love about research, which is I set out with this very specific goal in mind, which is I was going to use all my human factors toolbox to redesign this system and design something very specifically tailored to this older driver population. Um, 
But that's really not how science works. It doesn't give you just the result that you're looking for if you follow the science correctly. And so we followed the path and we followed our results and our findings. And this was the, this was the result. Not that tailored product that I thought we were going to wind up with, but a more universally um, applied design. And then once we started to think about this, I started to think about, well, let's think, rethink about these older driver risks that I brought up early on. Why are older drivers so risky? Well, I said that they have you know, declining information processing skills and visual search strategies. Well, so do novice drivers, right? For, for slightly different reasons, but the outcome is the same. They all have trouble searching their visual environment and, and processing information really quickly as they drive. Um, they don't wear their seatbelts, but neither do rural drivers, right? Um, and older drivers and novice drivers both inaccurately judge their ability to detect hazards. So these things are, are kind of seem unique to older drivers, but they're really not unique to older drivers. They're unique to a lot of at-risk drivers. So when we think about this universal um, design system, we had been working on that TDSS system and turning it into something that was a little more um, smoothed out for, for commercially available product. Um, and something that was called Road Coach. And so by the time that was made, they had already pulled out all the references to teens and parents. And it was already sort of generic in terms of drivers. You had this capability to notify another person, but it wasn't really in the language. Parents and teens were no nowhere in that. And so our final recommendations were we don't really need to make any changes. This system that was designed by teens but then kind of smoothed out to hit the market is perfect for older drivers because it's perfect for all drivers. Um, so now our ability to create this universal um, platform through the system called Road Coach, um, which you notice doesn't have the word aging or senior or older or season or any of those clever things that I thought of, and certainly not teen. Um, it's just pretty generic that you're being coached on the road. Um, so doesn't doesn't exclude or include any one age group. So um, we wanted to do then a controlled field test to see if we actually give this product out to older drivers, what's going to happen? We put them on the roadway um, to test this in vehicle feedback and a really realistic driving environment. We still want it to be slightly controlled so we can um, ensure that they're going to get at least a minimum amount of messages or alerts, right? It's very hard for me to, to run a study, actually put an older person on the road and say, I want you to go 80 in the 65 and we'll see what happens. Right? IRB is not going to let me do that. Um, but we can expose them to different speed limits, changing speed limits, and if they go against our wishes and speed a little bit, they'll see what happens right, with the app. So we tested um, 11 older drivers ranging from 66 to 80. Most of them were male that agreed to, to participate in the study. Um, none of them reported any cognitive or visual or hearing impairments that would limit their ability to drive. And um, nearly all of them said that they drove five to six times a week. We used our, our lab vehicle. It's a Chevy Impala. We mounted a um, Samsung Galaxy um, S7 to the dash. Um, and we utilized the forward-facing camera in the study. So just a couple of the routes that we did. So we wanted them to kind of see the system um, before they started driving. So we started on campus. We headed out um, over to a nearby rec center, and that was about 12 minutes. So they could see sort of what it's going to do when you're driving with it. Um, then once we got to this rec center, we had them drive the Impala sort of around this block. It was about a five-minute route without the system running. So that way they can just familiarize themselves to the Impala. Right? It's always a little... Um, nerve-wracking to drive a car that you're not very familiar with. Um, and then once we did that, we said, okay, we're going to go on this experimental route. So that was 280 kind of over and then 35W down and back to the university. And they drove that whole time um, with the system running. So this is kind of what it would have looked like um, when they were in the yellow zone. So going, say, three and a half miles over the 55 speed limit. Um, we had this uh, app running that had a forward-facing camera. We had a little piece of black tape so that wasn't distracting and they couldn't see that little bubble, but that just sort of showed us that it was 
running collecting data. Um, we didn't want something super intr intrusive like a wearable eye tracker, but we did want to be able to capture when we noticed them look right down into the camera. So that forward-facing video capture was really great for that as a really low cost um, and, and not very time intensive way to analyze eye gazes. Um, because that's one of the big concerns, is we don't want this to be visually distracting. And, and we found it really wasn't. So in the 13 minute drive, um, they made an average of 22.7 gazes, um, so uh, um, 1.68 times per minute, but the average gauge duration was less than 500 milliseconds. So these weren't really long glances at the phone. These were very quick little glances to the phone and back to the road. Um, and looking at the, the warning that seemed to get the most glances, because when we think about visual distraction, the standard is really um, any sort of icon or message or warning should take about no more than two glances total, and those glances shouldn't last more than two seconds. So while this yellow was up, we saw they were slightly more likely to do about um, three and a half gazes. Um, but when, when it was red, when they were really speeding, we saw very, very few gazes. For the most part, they were relying on auditory cues. Now, in the yellow speed zone, there weren't any audio, audio cues. So it would make sense that they spend a little bit more time looking at that message because there wasn't any audio available to them. And then we also looked at what was their um, user satisfaction. So we had them rate what was their, their mental workload and how satisfied were they with using the system. So we saw that they reported a little effort on our RSME score. Um, and then what was really surprising was how much they loved this thing. After they tested it, um, we gave them this thing that's called the SUS, the System Usability Scale, and the average score was 93.86. A typical score for something that's like average usability is 68. I've never run a study that had 98% average on the SIS before. Um, when we asked them kind of how much would you pay for an app like this, they're like $100, $150. We're like, what? That's not how much apps cost. <laughs> you made a statement earlier that um, I think um, needs to be challenged, and that is that the automotive manufacturers, particularly the dealers, are not marketing to older people. Okay. And, and I would challenge you to go to a Mercedes dealer or even a Subaru dealer as my daughter. I'm seven okay. years old. And watch how the vehicle is marketed to me. Sure. Because the Subaru has the speed indicator, has lane departure notification, it has the stop function. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, um, my girlfriend, who's 72, and I went and purchased a new one, mm -hmm. and they marketed that hard. Oh, sure. Really hard. Yeah. And um, I would say that, that that statement is not accurate if you look like you are, as in your case, under 40. <laughs> so I should have prefaced that to say, not necessarily the dealers. I don't know what they're doing. Um, I did go to the Mercedes headquarters in California and pitch them to the pitch this system to them years ago, and they said, no, thank the you. The new Mercedes has most of what you're talking about. <laughs> sure, right. It and they said, has a flash right. that tells you when you're going too slow. Yeah, and they said at the time, this could be good, but our, um, our buyers are not going to be pleased to hear that we're, we're putting something for older drivers in our cars. So that's, that's really what I mean. So what did they like about this system? Well, they said that they thought it helped them stay focused, um, which is great, right? Um, we, we certainly don't want them to feel distracted, but they really felt like it helped them stay focused on driving. Um, they liked the, the warnings, so they really liked you know, the speed warnings, so letting them know what is the speed limit, if the speed limit's changing. Um, they got an opportunity to see all the warnings afterward, they didn't get to experience any of the advanced curve warnings in this controlled field test, but when they got to see other things like it and heard that that was a feature, that was one of their favorite features. They were really excited about something like that. Um, we, we actually thought that the seven mile an hour threshold would need to be changed. We came up with that through our interviews with parents. So parents had said, I don't want you to warn me. I don't want you to send me a text message when my teen is speeding at five miles an hour. Um, 10 is probably too much, so let me know at 7. And that's how we landed on 7, right? Um, so we thought maybe it needed to be changed to 10 
with older drivers or adult drivers, um, but that's not what we heard in this group. They thought seven was perfect, and that's, that's what they wanted. And I think the, the idea was that if they want to speed, like really want to speed, they're not using this system. But if they're driving in an area where they don't want to speed, they want to be sure that they're following the speed limit, then they want it low. They want it at seven. Right? Um, what did they not like? Well, they didn't like the voice for the audio, um, so that you know, particular voice wasn't um, what they were really looking for. Occasionally, the speed was mismatched to what's on the phone, and that just happens, that signs get moved a little bit up and down the roadway, and so it's going to tell you 55, but you already saw 45, and then it's maybe 10 second delay before it actually changes to 45. So that kind of thing is a little annoying. Um, the aggressive driving maneuvers, so we got a little pushback on that. So the older drivers would say, like, that heartbreaking maneuver, that was fine. And we're like, well, I don't know. The computer didn't think so. Um, but they, um, in this group anyway, um, we got some pushback that they didn't really um, think that some of those things were appropriate. They thought it was too sensitive on the hard breaking. Um, and this optional feature of text messaging someone, you can put in anyone, um, they didn't really like that. So we spent a lot of time talking in the focus groups about who might you want to share this information with? Would you want to share it with an adult child? The answer was no don't want to share this information with their children. Um, not really a, a even physician. The, the most likely thing we heard was maybe a trusted friend. But this didn't seem like um, a, a feature that was very um, open. So our conclusions. Um, a universally designed in-vehicle system had high user acceptance among older drivers in our confult, controlled field test. So our next step is to do a, con, a, a field operational test. So that's coming up in this coming year. We're going to be testing 30 older drivers, 15 in Minnesota, 15 in Kansas. We're going to do three weeks of baseline data collection. So just collecting, you know, what are their braking, what is their speeding like, all of these baseline maneuvers without any feedback. Then we'll turn on the full system where they'll experience the feedback for six weeks and turn it back off and see do we have any carryover effects of those changes in behavior. So our goal is to see... Can we actually reduce risky driving behavior? So if we see pervasive speeding, can we reduce that? If we see pervasive heartbreaking, can we reduce that? Um, and also is acceptance high after prolonged use, right? So it might seem good to use this as a one-off, um, but would it be annoying for continual use? Um, and really that's the, that's the upcoming questions that we have for this study. So that's it. All right, so any um, additional questions? Yeah. Um, have you looked at trying to get the system to work while like directions are being given? Because a lot of people have their phone up and are like having directions, but mm -hmm. then how would that interact with that? Yeah. So how we were hoping it could work um, was that, um, and this is the hard thing because. Uh, it's very hard to get the system to work the way that we want it on iPhone. But on Android, for a while, it, we could do this draw-on feature. So that's what we were testing in the simulation, where if you could have something else running like Google Navigation, you would have a little draw-on in the corner showing you a small speed limit sign, and then if it got an actual warning, it would pop up and take over the rest of the screen and then go back down. Um, and then some point when we were trying to work with developers on that, they changed the, the opportunities for the draw-on feature and pulled that back because I think app developers were going crazy with it. Um, so how it works now is it will run in the background and talk through. So you can still hear all those messages, but you're not going to see it live. Um, and I think we're going to try, I don't know, we're going to be trying to pull from the data. I think we're going to be able to know in the field operational test how often it's running in the foreground versus the background. So we'll try to get a little bit of, we won't be able to control that because they can pull stuff up in front of it, but then we'll see how often are they doing that, like what percentage of miles is in the foreground or background. Yeah? Have you ever driven with a Valentine uh, radar detector navigating, navigation box? Um, Valentine, no. Valentine makes that's a radar wireless. detector that's a combination. That's the wireless one? Yeah. I mean, I've used Garmin and other similar. The Valentine one has a built-in radar detection function, satellite nav, and it has the speed limit function that you have talked about mm -hmm. on your phone. Mm -hmm. It's in there already. Mm -hmm. Right. And, it will, and you can set the threshold, clear up to 10, and it will scream at you. It literally does. You know, it beep, you get 10 ah. 
I have that on my that motorcycle. That doesn't seem very safe. <laughs> I have that on my motorcycle because the motorcycle is way too fast. Sure. And I need that. But, um, and it will jump speed limits as you go into a town. Um, and, and it actually flashes when it does that. Mm -hmm. And if you're below the minimum speed on a freeway, it will flash that. Okay. So it, it, they have that system, and it also pops in arrows when you're supposed to turn and how many miles to win. And then it will verbally tell you when you're uh, within, it starts at a quarter of a mile away, mm -hmm. and it takes you down to 100 feet. Okay. And, and um, that's, that is available. It's been out there for about four years, but it's about 300 bucks. Sure. Yeah. All right. I'm afraid uh, we're going to have to bring this to a close. I just wanted to thank our speaker for an excellent presentation. <laughs> I do want to invite everybody back uh, next week. Uh, next week we will have another speaker. Uh, and uh, Brendan Englott uh, will be coming here from the Stevens Institute of Technology. He'll be talking about towards minimalistic and learning-enabled autonomous navigation. Uh, and I certainly would invite everybody back here or tune us in uh, on the web. It will be broadcast uh, live. And by the way, all these uh, seminars uh, will be archived and will be available uh, on the web, so you'll be able to watch them offline anytime. And when will this one be archived and ready? Within seven days. Okay, one week from now, you'll be able to start tuning in to previous seminars. Beg, beg your pardon? What about the PowerPoint I'm sorry. It'll be, a, it'll be a part of it, yeah. So when it, when it gets uploaded in the archive, it'll have the PowerPoint as a, a part yes. of the video stream. Right, right. It will show you both the, uh, the PowerPoint slides and the speaker, I believe. That's what yes. they used to do in so, the past. So we won't have it like now to write a report if you want to write a report on this. Oh, for writing reports, uh, you're going to have to, when are they due, if I remember correctly, and I have to look at the syllabus. Next Wednesday. I'll see if I can get the videos up sooner. Not the videos, the presentation. Right, I'll see if I can get the presentation up sooner than. Then. It'll be on Moodle or just on YouTube? On, on YouTube. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll try to uh, expedite things as much as we can. Any other issues? Thank you, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in a week.